So yeah, sorry for the delay. Welcome to the to the session on DDI, CDI, and open data. Uh, we were still waiting for one of the presenters. He has still not shown up, but we will ho we're hoping that he will join us. We could therefore also not do the technical testing now. This is what, why we uh, were delaying a little bit. Um, also, um, in comparison to other Zoom or any other virtual meetings you might know, you are at the moment not seeing the other participants. Uh, thanks to GDPR regulations, so we cannot show the participant list without breaking any privacy laws. So therefore, if you would like to show yourself who you are and maybe know who else is in the meeting at the moment, it's, uh, it's uh, 44 people. Um, you can simply use the chat window just to say hi from wherever you are, if you want to show to the others that you are there and that you can also see people you normally would see at a DDI, uh, a European DDI conference. Um, also, I have to remind you this session, if you want to, to, to raise a question or, or anything else, this session is recorded. So if you are not happy with that, uh, simply do not uh, turn on your video or anything if you want to ask a question or do this via one of the windows. This is also, by the way, the, uh, the, the flow of the whole uh, meeting will run now. So we have four presentations in total. Um, after each presentation, there will be the possibility for a short question and answer session. You can simply put the uh, question into the question and answers window. It, it would be the preferred way because there is an infrastructure for that. But I will also look into the chat, what, what, what is there and, and, and voice the question for you when, uh, if you put something in there. But I can also, or Valentin can also give you the microphone if you want to ask the presenters directly, but then I would ask that you use the feature of raising your hand that we see you want to uh, pose an audio question. Okay, with, with that rules, um, I will, each, each presentation will be about 20 minutes. Arafan told me he will have a shorter one first because he's doing the first two presentations. His first one will be a little bit shorter. The second one will be a little bit longer. And I think this is also okay. So not that the other presenters get nervous that we don't keep the time. So this is uh, uh, something we agreed on before. And I will also say something like one or two minutes before each session stops. I will say, uh, or, or, or comes to an end, I will warn the presenter that uh, he or she is running out of time. And with that, I would like to, to, to hand, uh, um, yeah, introduce the first topic that we have, the CDI and cross-domain data sharing, collaboration with Code Data's uh, decadal program, which is uh, uh, presented by Arif and Gregory, who I know for a longer time, and most people who are longer involved in EDI other way, because he's some kind of a legend there. Uh, Arif and Gregory is a technology consultant working in the areas of standards for statistical and research data. His work spans the statistical data and metadata exchange, SDMX standard, the do data documentation initiative, DDI standards, and the generic statistical information model, GSIM, amongst others. He is currently the convener of the DDI group developing the DDI cross-domain integration, DDI-CDI specification, and is involved with organization of code data's decadal program. Okay, Garofan, the virtual floor is yours. Okay, I'm going to try to get my slides going here. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, good. Very, very good. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to give a very simple presentation today, if I can get my slides to function. Come on. Wow, that's odd. Um, hmm. There we go. It's, the structure is very simple. I'm going to talk about, about CoData and how they're going to be working with DDI. And the, the presentation, I've got some bad news, and then I have some good news, and then I have some details. So it, it's, it's a simple thing to get your head around here. We're going to start with the bad news. We have a problem. Um, one in every six Americans isn't certain that the world is round. One in six, that's 16.666%, whatever. Um, 7% of Brazilians reject the idea that the world is round. We're, and this is a growing phenomenon, and it's not just those two countries, it's the world over. People think the earth is flat, and they think it doesn't move, and it's covered in this dome, this transparent dome. It's absolutely crazy, right? 
these people drive cars, they use electricity, they go to the doctor, they're on the internet, they're on their cell phones, a lot of them have guns, at least in this country, and they don't believe in science. And that is, um, it, it defies belief to me. And um, what it really is symptomatic of is an anti-science idea in, in society. And um, if you're a flat earther and the fact that I'm calling you crazy and an idiot offends you, good, because you're crazy and an idiot. And more than that, you're a dangerous idiot. I live in a country where that idea, that anti-science idea, has led the government to not deal with a, a, a global pandemic in a coordinated way. And a lot of people, thousands of people probably, have died unnecessarily. And so anti-science is a real problem, and it's a, it's a dangerous thing. And I think we're seeing proof of that in this day and age. Um, so that's the bad news. Um, the good news, or a little bit of the good news, is that there are serious people who are looking at that problem and taking it seriously. Um, in 2018, there were two groups, international groups, that merged. One of them was the International Council of Scientific Unions. And that's a really an eyeful of unfamiliar acronyms to a lot of us. But these are people like the crystallographers and the physicists and all the hard sciences. And then there was the International Social Science Council, which I think is a little uh, closer to home for most of us. Um, and these people combined forces to produce the International Science Council. And the idea, the driver for that, was they felt that if they spoke with a single voice, if there was one scientific international body, they would have a louder voice. And they did this in part because of this anti-science sentiment that's growing around the world. Um, and they, they have a simple mission that I think we can all agree with. They think science is a global public good and they wanna promote it. And if you look at history and you look at the world, it's very hard to deny that science is a global public good. I think rational people would agree with that. And so um, the, the, uh, they came into existence a couple of years ago. And um, a lot of you are probably saying, well, what, what's this got to do with DDI? Well, we're getting a little closer here. Um, they have a committee on data called CODATA, which you may have heard of. And they are allied with the International Science Council and governed by them, although they're a separate organization. They're based in Paris. And they're very much about open science and fair data. And, um, that is something I think that resonates with a, a lot of what we in the DDI community are, are interested in. And they have members like national data committees and scientific academies, uh, the scientific unions are a big part of their membership, but they're gonna have a new member. And guess who that is? You probably already did, you might've already known. It's gonna be the DDI Alliance. We've been invited to join CODATA. Um, I think this is really good news and we're getting to the good news part of my presentation here. Um, because in some ways that's a recognition of work that we, that we, the Alliance, has been doing for decades now. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about CODATA. I didn't write this slide. Anyone who knows me knows that I would never put that many graphics on one slide. Um, these are mostly their publications and things. And if you start at the left, they, they have a policy um, element, aspect to them where they talk to governments about data policy and so on. They're very into data science. They have a thing called the Data Science Journal that's pretty good. They do workshops and so on. They do a lot of training. So um, they have a school of research data science and they work with GoFair and RDA and some other people. And they do webinars with like 700 people. Like they do some really big training initiatives around research data management even, um, which, which I think is great. And I, I, I put the last column in a red box and I, okay, I admit I bumped up our logo a little bit, but in the last column, which is data to improve our world, there's this big DDI logo there. Now, most of their membership don't have their logos on this page. And I thought it was kind of cool they put ours there. Um, and there's a reason for that because they aren't the only people with a new member. So is the DDI Alliance. CODATA is joining the DDI Alliance because this isn't just an invitation for us to join CODATA. It's a, it's a partnership agreement. And as I understand it, they, the, the executive board and, and the CODATA executive have been talking for months actually about this, and they had the lawyers go through the fine print and everything. And this is basically a done deal. I don't think it's officially agreed yet. They have to sign the paperwork, but at this point, it's just paperwork. Um, and what's happening here is that CODATA is going to be our newest member, and we're joining um, CODATA because we're going to be partnering and formally agreeing to work together 
And the, the key part of that work is going to be around a thing called the Decadal Program. And we just call it the Decadal Program. I've been working with CoData now for about a year um, in making data work for cross-domain grand challenges. It's a great name. In America, we don't have grand anything other than the Grand Canyon. We do big a lot, like big food especially, but grand is a very European sounding thing to us. But I think it's a good name and it explains the idea. Um, if you read this document, which is really their, strat their strategic plan, it talks a lot about the Decadal Program. Um, and the Decadal Program is going to officially launch in 2021, in October, at their annual meeting, but it's already sort of gaining momentum. They say some very interesting things in this document about that program, though, and it's been approved by the International Science Council and so on. It's a, it's a, a, a thing that's going to happen. They talk about the, the big research problems that face us today, things like climate change and, and pandemics and so on. And they, they characterize them as being fundamentally transdisciplinary. That is problems that can't be solved by any single domain working in isolation. And when, they, when you think about that from a data perspective, that means cross domain data sharing, right? Um, and so that's a big topic with them. Another interesting thing to point out um, is that they don't see technology as a limiting factor in research. They see it as an enabling one because think about it. We have processing power like we've never had in the past. We have big data technology. We have things like machine learning that help us analyze data, huge amounts of data. And that's not the issue. The issue is the data itself and mostly knowing what it is. And um, when you realize that the limiting factor in cross-domain research is actually the metadata, you can see why an organization like CoData might be interested in the DDI Alliance, because that's our that's where we come into the picture. And we've been working for years to try to make data more usable and to explain what it is so that people can take it and do things with it. And that's a critical ingredient in cross-domain data sharing. So um, really CoData looks at a lot of different areas. Um, at certainly standards for, for data and metadata, but also a lot of the semantic technologies, a lot of infrastructures. They're big promoters of things like the European Open Science Cloud and now the African Open Science Platform, um, those kinds of, of data sharing communities, um, and generally are very involved with FAIR and open science. So they're really our kind of organization in a lot of ways. They care about a lot of the same things, but maybe with a little broader focus. Um, they have an interesting way of working, and I don't think you'll necessarily get this from reading any of their documentation, but they have a very practical attitude. When they look at, at, the, at the grand challenges, the Decadal Program, they're looking at things like infectious disease, and even before COVID, they'd identified that, disaster risk reduction, so the Sendai framework that the UN has agreed, um, resilient cities, climate change. These are the kinds of issues that are urgent. They're huge research problems, and they're very urgent, right? And, and the co-data attitude towards these is, let's take real programs, real use cases, look at their actual problems and figure out how to solve those problems. If you're gonna boil the ocean, you need to do it a bit at a time. And they, have, they basically say, let's be practical. Let's, let's focus on actual use cases and real projects. So that's their, their basic working methodology. What they aim to do with, with what they learn is to provide guidance and what they call convergence around best practice. They're not a standards organization. They're not a solutions provider. What they really wanna do is help people solve the problems they face using existing standards and technology and help those things work together in a good way. And so they're looking in a lot of different areas. Again, data, data and metadata standards, classifications, ontologies, provenance is a big thing with them, data sharing infrastructure. Um, and so these are all areas where bringing people together to talk about what they're good at, what they're able to do, um, could, could do some real good in the world. And that's sort of their approach to things. There's an, there, today, to the sort of left of the line on this slide, there's um, kind of what's going on to plan for the Decadal Program, and that's going to turn into something more formal in future once they launch. But there's a, what we call the Dagstuhl Planning Group. This is myself and Akim Vakaro and Steve McEachern, who I'm sure you know, and a guy named Simon Cox. He's a, a geographer from an institute in Australia called Sosairo. And Simon Hodson, who is the executive director of CoData. And we have meetings about once a week and we have organized a couple of Dagstuhl workshops over the past, we've done two of them so far. 
and this is really where we met CoData initially, but it was clear there was a lot of synergy there. And that group still meets on a weekly basis. It's become sort of a, a brainstorming group, informal brainstorming group for the decadal program. And we're not the only one. They, they talk a lot to people at FAIR and other organizations too, but we've been sort of helping them shape up what this program will look like. And we've already started engaging various projects on the ground um, that will contribute to this. And there are some initial working groups and things that are forming. Um, in time, they, they will become more formal. They'll have an official governing council, which is likely to be the, the group that communicates with ISC and uh, meets annually probably. And then a more active advisory, um, technical advisory and scientific advisory council, probably about a dozen people, big names out of various domains to give sort of strategic guidance. And then um, a couple of groups, one is a distributed secretariat, which is really for program coordination and support and another group which will be, have a more technical focus and they're calling it a cohort of experts. Those positions are gonna be paid positions. So there will be people working for the decadal program, doing actual work, um, coordinating all of the work on the ground. And a lot of those people will be taking part in real projects, but we see there being a large, large number of different kinds of committees and projects feeding information into the decadal program and contributing to the sort of best practice and convergence and that vision. And so that's that's from here what, what this kind of organization looks like. Again, this is not a, an official agreed thing at this point. This is their slide from a presentation that was given to the RDA plenary a couple of weeks back. Um, so the question is a bit, how does DDI fit into this picture? And to some extent, I, I think, they want to partner with us because we're already doing a lot of fair things. When you look at around at the portals and catalogs that are out there, you look at things like the International Household Survey Network that has introduced DDI codebook all over Africa and a lot of the lower and middle income countries. Um, you look at the data archives and the research centers and producers, national statistical organizations. There's quite a bit of DDI out there today. And it is, it is in many ways the hard part Right, we do detailed granular metadata. It's expensive, but it's also very effective. And a lot of the, the most findable and usable data is documented in DDI. And I think there's a growing awareness of that in the world. Um, and so I think they're interested in, in the work we've done in the social sciences and related domains. There's a huge focus on the SDGs and how microdata fits into that picture. And DDI gets mentioned there a lot. Um, however, there's also, I think a huge interest in DDI CDI because it explicitly focuses on data integration and reuse. And that in, in a, a, a program that's about cross-domain data sharing is obviously interesting. There aren't a lot of standards or specifications in the space that focus on cross-domain data sharing. And the fact that DDI is producing one, I think recommends us pretty strongly to, to CoData. Um, you know, DDI CDI isn't domain specific. It's not tied to a particular life cycle. Um, it doesn't have a limited view of data formats. Um, it's very into provenance and rich provenance that is a lot of the context you need for cross-domain use. Themes like automation and replication of findings. I'll be talking more about this in the next presentation, but all of these things are important to CoData in terms of how they see the decadal program approaching the problems around cross-domain data sharing. So I think that's quite a good alignment with the things that the DDI Alliance is doing anyway. There's a bit of a bigger picture here as well. There's a thing called Data Together. Now you're probably familiar with the Research Data Alliance and Go Fair, and um, you might be familiar with the World Data System. They they worked a lot with the Good Housekeeping Seal of Approval people um, out of Dan's and some other places. It was a big topic in the DDI community a couple of years back, um, and they helped make that more of an international standard. They're really focused on on uh, data repositories. They're also part of the International Science Council. Those four organizations have launched a thing called Data Together, which is really a, an agreement to, to work in a collaborating way, collaborative way around these kinds of issues. And the Decadal program is part of that. They're looking at um, a lot of groups that have come out of, of the COVID epidemic, like VODAN, which is a an, an semantic version of the World Health Organization common uh, reporting form. There's a lot of work going on in the RDA EPI group, you may know Jay, Jay Greenfield was very active in that group. They did some good work. And now there's going to be a second round of that um, coming up. So there's starting to be some interesting work underneath the data together rubric. 
and fitting code data together with people like RDA and GoFair, which I think is important. Um, we've already been doing a lot of work with code data. <clears throat> For the CDI, DDI CDI public review, they've been incredibly helpful. Um, we wanted uh, with that minutes. public review to, to, to reach out to um, a lot of external domains. And so they've let us use their go to webinar instance. They gave us the benefit of all of their membership lists in, in the scientific unions and so on. They've been invaluable. Um, we've had some initial discussions with CoData around from the training group in DDI. And there's some ideas that we might work with RDA, with GoFair in, in some different areas. None of that's really decided yet, but we've started having those discussions. I think DDI is gonna start engaging more directly with GoFair around fair implementation profiles, fair digital objects, and some of those initiatives. And um, the last thing is, there, CoData is now leading an, a project in the European Open Science Cloud, looking at how DDI CDI can be applied to data sharing within EOSC. Now, Akim and myself are the DDI people on that project, but they're actually leading it. Um, so you can see we're already working with them. I can't tell you what we're going to do together with them now that there's a formal relationship, but I think it's amazing that there is a formal relationship. Um, at the end of the day, we actually do live on a sphere, and when you live on a sphere, the sky is the limit. But I think this partnership is a real sign that the DDI Alliance is maturing and taking a place globally that, that I think it's earned by doing good work over the years. So that's it, um, Ingo. That's my presentation, this one. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then, of course, the question to the audience. Also, I think we can take one or two questions in between. Then I'll have Eric start this next presentation. Are there any questions? Currently, I don't see anything in the chat window and nothing in the Q&A window. But I have a question because I would like to link back to the very beginning uh, of, of what you told. Um, so I completely understand how, how, how the new collaboration can improve science uh, or the collaboration in science uh, by merging metadata standards by crossing domains and everything. But is there any strategy that you uh, or code data or the whole uh, infrastructure can play back to those um, flat earth and uh, chemtrail people? Because I don't know how, how you can really convince them uh, with, with improving infrastructure. Do you have any strategies that link back to this kind of audience to maybe get them back into the boat of normality? Um. Okay, no, I don't think so. I think it's helpless. I think it's a lost cause. And I think the, the the real thing you have to do is make sure that science stays strong and that governments understand that it needs to be funded. And I think at the end of the day, a lot of this comes down to funding. Um, there is a lot of defunding of science going on in, in, in Trump's America, for instance. That's very alarming to people. And COVID has counterbalanced that somewhat. But if governments don't value science, then you have a problem. And I think the answer there is really to make sure that the message that we need more research in the face of things like climate change and not less is the way you counter that. I don't think there's any way to convince flat earth people ra with rational arguments because um, they've already run I, I, and they, they've lost that one, right? If they were rational, they wouldn't be flat earthers in the first place. And that's, so to my mind, it's really that policy function and making sure that scientific scientific agendas are, are pushed and that funding goes to research at, at the end of the day. I think it's that simple. Um, and so I'm probably the wrong person to ask about the actual strategy at that level because I'm more of a technical person, mm -hmm. but certainly they're active in that, in that area. But I, I do think at the end of the day, funding is where the rubber meets the road as it were. So. Okay, thank you. And we have another question. Uh, the United Nations has an initiative, Global Data Convention. Is this taken into account? I'm not super familiar with that. Um, I, I would imagine that's somewhere in the picture. Um, we, we have organized with CoData a session at the UN Data Forum. We're working a lot with people at the UN around the SDG indicators. Um, I'm sure those people are aware of that kind of convention. I'm, that's not, I'm not gonna claim familiarity with that actually. I, it sounds a little familiar, but I couldn't speak to that, I'm sorry. Um, I would be very surprised if that weren't a factor in their thinking, however. Again, I may be too technical to be to be answering these questions. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, maybe looking for time, we have to start with the second presentation. So okay. again, yes. the floor is yours, and the virtual floor is yours. All right, very good. So let me um, get to the top of that presentation. I'm going to take this quite quickly. Um, because there's a lot of slides. Now, I wrote a lot of these with Hilda, who's in the audience, and with Akim, who might be in the audience, I'm not sure. Um, but I'm gonna be talking um, sort of as the, con as the convener and one of the organizers of the, the modeling testing and representation group. And just give you sort of an update where we are and the sort of implementations we're seeing, what we think the implementations will be around DDI, CDI. And this, the spec is not uh, final yet, so things are still changing. But I'm going to give you as much of a, 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 um, an impression as I can from here. I want to make a comment about FAIR first, because this whole eddy is basically about FAIR and DDI. And um, in my experience, people talk a lot about findability and access when they talk about FAIR, because you know schema.org and DCAT are cool, and it's the easy part, right? Um, you don't hear people talking as much about interoperability and reuse, because that stuff is expensive and hard. And so um, when I look at FAIR, I think things like DDI, CDI, sure, they help with findability, but um, really they're focused on, on the I and the R. And I, I think there needs to be more attention paid there because funders have not always given money to infrastructure so much as research. And um, I think there's a lot of heavy lifting that we need to do. And the DDI is pretty good at heavy lifting traditionally. And I think we're gonna have to do some more of it if people are really gonna, gonna realize this fair vision. Um, DDI CDI is a really different standard from Codebook and Lifecycle. Um, Codebook and Lifecycle are good XML standards with granular machine actionable metadata for the social behavioral economic sciences. They get used in public health and official statistics for some data. Um, and, but really they're, they're social sciences standards. That's where the terminology and the models come from. Uh, DDI-CDI is a different thing because it's not, it's by its nature working with data coming from other domains, which means that there's some different types of data, structures and models, different terminology. It's maybe a little more abstract um, because it's really a different kind of spec. It's meant to be used with other standards, including the other DDI standards, not to replace them. And that's an important message here. Um, a little bit of history here. It was at the Eddy in 2018 in Berlin. There was sort of a, a side meeting that agreed that we needed to bring the DDI-4 or DDI moving forward model to market. And an agreement was reached that if we could take a year and produce a product, a draft product from that model, that that would be a good thing. And so Akim was responsible, I think, for pulling together what became the modeling re representation and testing group. This was in January or February of 2019. And we took a year and we produced a draft specification that is now DDI CDI, although we called it DDI core at the time. Um, and we identified a number of cases to work from actual sort of implementations to help inform the work because we needed for it to be real and, and implementable. I won't describe those in any detail. Um, a quick history here. It was a small group. There were nine of us and there was no turnover. Everyone has stayed in the group and worked very, very hard for a year. We were meeting as many as three or four times a week, but definitely once a week on a routine basis for a year, a little over. And um, we had a sprint at StatsCan in the margins of Natty in 2019. We had a, a sprint at Dagstool the following October, and we came out with a pub, pub, public review release in April of this year. Um, which was a little more than a year, but not a lot more than a year. I think it was 13, 14 months. Um, and we've gone into webinar mode where we've trying to encourage people both inside the DDI community and outside to review the spec. We've talked at this point to more than 250 people because CoData has helped us put on these webinars, which is great. We're doing another one on Wednesday around processing and provenance. Flavio and um, Rizzolo and Jay Greenfield are gonna be talking about that part of the model. Um, and so we're not quite done, but we're reaching the end of that work. Um, and we've got a lot of feedback from there. COVID has slowed things down a bit, I have to say. Throughout, we've tried to work well with other parts of the Alliance. Here's a picture of us, minus Wendy and Oliver Hopped, who were not able to make it because they had a TC meeting. But there we are at Dagstool, and you probably know these characters, a lot of you. Um, there was an interesting thing that happened as we did the work which was we, when we started, we thought we were doing a core of the DDI4 model that was going to replace Lifecycle. 
And as we got into these projects, our test cases, we realized that wasn't what they wanted. They didn't want a replacement for a DDI codebook or DDI lifecycle. They wanted additional functionality to do different things. And so we shifted our focus a little bit. And I think this was a very good development. DDI CDI has emerged as a companion to codebook and lifecycle um, because the SBE community needs better data integration tools. They're using a lot of data from outside their domains, integrating more data within their domains, and they need better tools for doing that. And that's what we learned. The thing is, a lot of other domains have the same problem. And so DDI-CDI sort of came out of that change in purpose. It, it makes sense when you think about the real world. We're looking at bigger research projects. Um, we're looking at more data from more different sources. Things like geolocated tweets that weren't considered data at all in the past are now data. We have you know, better ways of computing with the data. Um, but with all of those changes in research come corresponding changes in, in, in data and metadata management. We need more complete, more machine actionable metadata because you need to know more about the data if it's not coming from your own domain where it's familiar. If the formats and structures are different, if the semantics are different, and there are lots of demands that come into the picture there that didn't used to happen. And those were the kinds of requirements we were seeing from the projects we, we were implementing DEI, CDI with. Um, I think I've largely covered all of this already. We're talking about describing new types of data. We're talking about expanding our ability to describe process and provenance. And we're talking about describing data integration. And that's really what DDI CDI is focused on. It does not replace codebook and it does not replace lifecycle. Neither does it require them though. Um, here's a big change. The main thing about DDI CDI is that it is a formal UML class model. It's based on a subset of UML. And we express that as canonical XMI, which is a well-supported subset of a standard for um, exchanging XML model, uh, UML models in XML. Um, I, Akim taught a workshop yesterday about how to implement um, based on the model in different technology platforms. And basically using the UML model buys us a lot of things. We do have a standard XML representation, but because UML is implementable in different technologies and because the tools exist to do that, it makes the model more extensible into the future because as new technologies come along, we give them the model, we can work with them. And because by their nature, UML models are themselves extensible. So it future-proofs us in a lot of ways, and that's good. This is a sort of mini simplified lifecycle data flow that we'll all recognize where you get some sort of raw data, sensor or survey data. You make an analysis data set out of it. You do some cleaning and recoding. And then you maybe do tabulations and produce aggregates. And then, especially in the official statistics world, you might produce indicators. Think like the SDG indicators there. That flow is what DDI-CDI describes. We look at the structures of the data at each stage. We look at the ways those, those data sets are connected with the processes and prominence. And we give you the ability to track individual data points as they work through that flow and are used in processes to produce new, new data points. And we capture that entire provenance chain. We rely very heavily on a lot of other standards to do that. But DDI-CDI provides the framework within which you can use things like SDTL and use other standards to make sense, coherent sense out of a, out of a flow of data like that. And that's really at the heart of what it is. And that's just an example. I mean, you could do any life cycle with this. Um, we have a lot of foundational metadata and basically we just took the metadata from the DDI4 model and implemented it. And the crown jewels there are the variable cascade. People like to talk about variables and they like to think that they mean the same thing when they use the term variable. It's not true. Variables do a lot of different things. And so we have a pretty nuanced model that we, that we uh, it also exists in GSIM. And this has been implemented also in DDI lifecycle called the variable cascade where you have the sort of very reusable definition of a variable and as a characteristic of a, of a unit. Um, and that's, that's a kind of variable. <clears throat> Oops, I've gone one too far. Then we have represented variables where you begin to talk about value domains and representations, what classification, what codes, and that's still reusable. And then you populate it with data and it becomes non-reusable, but it has a relationship to the other things. When we look at variables that way, you can do some pretty interesting stuff because you can understand with a set of instance variables how they are and are not the same. And that's a really useful kind of metadata. I think a lot of people understand this for doing things like 
um, repeat cross-sectional and, and, and uh, longitudinal studies. So one of the big applications we see of this is obviously helping with that um, problem. Now, if you're already using DDI lifecycle, you may already be doing this and DDI, CDI won't buy you very much. But if people who are using Codebook or people who are outside the DDI community are very, very interested in this feature of DDI, I have to say, this is quite powerful compared to what most domains do. Um, we also talk a lot about data structures, and there are four basic types that are subtyped into some sub um, different ones that I won't get into. But we deal with rectangular data, the wide data, with long data, which is good for events and uh, streaming data. We have key value data stores, which is really big data, if you want to think of it that way. And we deal with multidimensional cubes, N, N cubes, as they're called in, in other DDI standards. I'll show you some quick examples of that. And the key here is that the data points play different roles in different structures, even if they haven't changed. So here's a rectangular data file. And we have a, a unit identifier. It's an identifier component. We have a bunch of measure components, variables. And then we have an attribute, because the position in a blood pressure measurement isn't a measure. It's a, a piece of, of paradata that informs the measurement of things like the systolic and diastolic pressure and, um, and the pulse. So, Different bits of the of the this data set play different roles. Now, when I take that same data and cast it into a long data structure, I have some different roles. I still have an identifier, but now the date time becomes part of my identification because I can't disambiguate the observations without it. I have still my position attribute, but then I have this thing called a variable descriptor. This doesn't really exist because what it is is a set of references to variables so that you know which, which characteristic of that unit that you identified is being measured. And you can see that this has, a, it's the same data structured very differently with some different roles being played by some of the same values. Um, you might be, begin to get the picture here. With dimensional data, this is Hilda's uh, Norwegian fishing example. And you can see that the, the, you take the microdata, and in this case, a long table, and you, you express it as a, a, a tabulation. And you can see that the data has a direct relationship, but the identifiers in the aggregate are multidimensional keys that are actually formed from the dimension values on variables in the long table. And this is a completely different change of roles by many of the same data points and some new ones, because a lot of the values themselves might be derived. The last example is a simple one. We take this from the uh, semantic sensor network ontology uh, from W3C where you're taking different fields and combining them into a unitary key and maybe with a little bit of metadata like the timestamp for identifying values. And that's a sort of key value, a typical key value um, expression. We cover a, a range of different ways of, of doing keys in this kind of system. They're very, very common today. I think you get the picture here. We can track data points across structures by understanding the roles they play in different structures and the processes that relate them. I want to talk a little bit more about processing, but you can begin to get the picture that the application of this will be automating data integration. Uh, PwC did a report for the European Commission on the cost of having unfair data in European research. And my favorite fact, even though they mentioned DDI and SDMX by name in that report in a footnote, yes, um, they say that as much as 80% of the resource in a large research project goes to wrangling the data into shape before it can be analyzed. 80%, that's crazy expensive. Obviously, if you can automate some of that functionality, if you have better information about your data integration, you can begin to bring that number down, do more analysis, less data wrangling. And I think that's the idea. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the process model. Now, there are some very different ways that processes are described and DDI has always described individual processes. Um, we're getting to a point now though where we can string them together to describe that chain. And we, we work with a lot of other standards like SDTL and VTL. We can work with proprietary languages. There are really three different modes and one of these might be a little new to people. The first one is what we call procedural which is a step-by-step -step process where you have activities made up of steps with sub-steps that take inputs and outputs. And um, I think that's quite a familiar thing to people who use DDI. It's how we describe surveys for instance. And it's how we worked in DDI 4. But then we also have what we call black box processes, which are declarative processes. 
And um, these things are actually powered by magic. And there's no knowing what goes on inside a black box process engine, a, proceed, a declarative process engine, because it's nonlinear. These things are multi-threaded usually. Very, very powerful technology. It's pretty new. But they, they, take, uh, they have a different description where you sort of give them parameters. So, um, and then a, a playbook, they call it, full of functions, of templates. And you give it inputs and they produce outputs by applying the playbook until, until your criteria are met. It's a very different kind of thing. What we've modeled in DDI-CDI is a kind of control logic that can hand processes back and forth between the two, because that's a very common situation in these kinds of process engines. Um, here's my example. I'm doing some data cleaning. I'm going to inspect the data, identify problems, evaluate whether the data is worth cleaning and, and, and analyzing, and then um, continue and clean it. So very simple little sub process. And in a flow, you can see I have my first step inspecting the data, producing a report. Then I evaluate the report. I make a decision, either it's, it's crap or it's good. If it's good, I clean it. And then I produce the outputs. And I have some sort of flow logic that guides that. With a black box, however, what I do is I feed to my I, I, I feed the black box my input data and metadata, and then I tell it my completion criteria, and I give it a playbook of functions. And there's some sort of process control that manages that, and may or may not produce outputs depending on whether it's successful. And this is a little crazy, and I don't want to get too far into this. If you want to learn more about this, come to the, the webinar next Wednesday. Um, because you get into things like Alan, like, right, like um, you get into things l like temporal conditions and temporal flows. It's very, very crazy. But we can describe that stuff in DDI. I want to talk really quickly about a, uh, an application of this kind of provenance. And I'm just going to click through some screens. This is an example of DDI CDI metadata that we mined programmatically from an ETL platform called Pentaho, which was chaining Stata scripts to do a data harmonization. And we're gonna build an app, we're building an application that looks like this, where you have a step-by-step -step view of all the jobs and sub-jobs in the process and all the data sets, and you can focus on them and see from the perspective of a, a, a process, what data it uses and produces, or you can look at the data sets and see what produced the data or, or what will consume that data. And you can do things like click and look at the Stata files, you can see human readable documentation. You can see things like codebook documentation because we're actually mining DDI codebook so with, with, in this case, concept definitions. Um, you can see record structures, things like that. Again, codebook metadata, but integrated with the overall process flow. And we think that's kind of a cool way of bringing all of your metadata together and presenting it usefully to a researcher. And you can do things like this with DDI CDI. The last one, and this is basically almost my last slide, um, we see there being a big application for provenance metadata around data transparency and replication and reproduction of findings. You guys have, may have noticed that there was a very embarrassing retraction by some of the big medical journals because of, of publications based on garbage data that came that they couldn't ultimately identify the source of. This happened quite recently and there were some bad policy decisions based on that research. You need to avoid that stuff and the only way to do that is to have more transparency and be able to, to reproduce findings. And we think that's another place where this will become important. This is my last slide. Where we've gotten to here is this. We have a lot of engagement now from external domains and from reviewers within the DDI community, um, from our webinars and so on around DDI CDI. And we're gonna have to take that into, in, into account now and fix the spec. There's this EOS project I already mentioned that CoData is leading. Um, we have this week, a thing called the International Fair Convergence Symposium. That's a GoFair CoData thing. And there's a lot of DDI being presented there. Hilda and Jane and I are gonna be doing a workshop on Friday and we have 200 and more than 200 registrants already, which is crazy. Um, our next steps are gonna be to deal with a lot of the issues that came up out of the review. Things like new examples. We're looking at a thing called net CDF, which is a big data standard in a lot of the hard sciences. Gonna do an example, I think with DCAT for discovery. We have to look more at the upper model and work more with the fair, uh, implementation profiles and fair data objects, some of those standards. Ultimately, we're looking at releasing a spec in Q2 of 2021, which is a little later than we'd hoped, but COVID slowed us. So that's where we are. We're still out for public review, but we're getting to the end of that period. So after early January, I think we're going to go back to work actually making the changes and trying to finalize the spec. So that's um, the report.
Yeah, thanks, Arifan. Um, highly interesting, highly interesting. So, because we are a little bit late on time, um, does anyone have a question? So there's time for one at least. You have also the possibility to ask questions at the end, depending on how we make it in time. Um, but then to save time, uh, I would like to go to the next presentation uh, so that we might gain some uh, speed. So the next presentation um, is done by Tom Emery. Um, and he is the deputy director of Odyssey and an associate professor of sociology at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. He is not, he's originally a social scientist and uh, claims not to be an expert in, in DDI, but uh, he has several experts on his team uh, who can also present at the moment and will also be able to answer questions at the end of the presentation or just to speed things up. I think we hear a lot of things about Odyssey during the presentation. I give the virtual floor to Tom. Hi, can you, you, you can hear me, I, I hope and assume? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so basically, yeah, I'm going to be presenting a little bit about the, the Odyssey portal. Uh, before I do, though, uh, as was mentioned, my co-authors are in the chat as well. So I'm very much just the presenter of this, but the real knowledge, the real expertise is, is in the audience. So it's quite a nice kind of treat for you. You can ask questions and, and clarify some of maybe my jumbled statements and, and they will be able to provide the answers as we go. And that might be a bit more efficient way to deal with this as well. So, um, yeah, let me begin by uh, introducing Odyssey a little bit. So Odyssey is the Dutch National Infrastructure, sorry, the next, ah, there we go. The, is the Dutch National Infrastructure for Social Sciences. It's, it's really a big uh, collaborative consortium. We have uh, 40 member organizations and they all pay into to Odyssey uh, really to, to develop social science uh, infrastructure in the Netherlands. It's a really diverse consortium as well. We have um, pretty much every social science faculty in the Netherlands is a member, but also we have uh, research institutes from the, the Dutch uh, Royal Academy of Sciences. We have um, uh, DANS, the National Data Archive, obviously very well known in the, the DDI community. Uh, then we have uh, Statistics Netherlands as well, the Statist National Statistical Office, um, public research agencies, uh, as well as some e-infrastructure partners uh, in terms of uh, SURF uh, and the Netherlands e-Science Center who provide uh, software and hardware for, for research purposes in the Netherlands. So it's it's a really diverse consortium of partners. Uh, and we, as I say, we've come together to, to improve the data infrastructure in the Netherlands. Um, and yeah, so basically the, the, in the last year, we've been awarded a grant by the Dutch uh, funding agency uh, of uh, 14 million euros to, to improve the social science infrastructure in the Netherlands. Uh, and within this work program over the next four years, we've got uh, four or separate components. And I just wanted to give you a brief overview of all the different parts we're really bringing into this, uh, into Odyssey. So we have in the center there, there's the hub, which is really where all the coordination happens, but also uh, researchers are uh, serviced. So we have courses, uh, work, workshops, and these kind of things. And researchers are kind of guided through the infrastructures, uh, various services. Uh, then we have uh, at the top there, what's called the data facility. That's where researchers can access uh, data, uh, the statistical office. They can also use HPC facilities that we've developed uh, in combination with various data uh, in Odyssey. Uh, we have what we call the laboratory, which is where people can uh, fill questions in an online panel called the, the LIS panel, which is a, a long established panel in the Netherlands. Uh, and we also have the observatory, which is a collection of ongoing data collections in the Netherlands, some of which you'll probably be familiar with as, the, the, uh, as they are international studies and we, we support the Dutch component of but they're also quite diverse uh, national studies as well. Um, so I wanted to go over a few of these here. So as you can see, we've got the European Social Survey in the Netherlands is supported by Odyssey and the GDP share. We also have the uh, National Kiesel Onderzoek, uh, which is the Dutch election study. Um, all the data that's deposited in DANCE, in Easy Dance, um, uh, is also uh, integrated into uh, Odyssey. We have the ne Netherlands Twin Register, this panel, and what's called the Historical Sample of the Netherlands, which is uh, old, old census records being integrated um, and, and linked over time 
uh, to produce a kind of continuous record of people. So historical uh, demography project, really. Uh, and then that's all, all linkable really to the, to the data within Statistics Netherlands. So all the samples, for example, within uh, GGP or SHARE, they're drawn from Statistics Netherlands and those survey data can then be linked to personal records within CBS as well. And this is something that really marks uh, Odyssey out as being quite a, a more complex project than, than maybe your traditional data catalog. Um, but navigating across this diverse data is, is really difficult. And we came up with a few um, problem cases, uh, use cases that we really needed to address when developing our research proposal. And that's kind of the, the, the stage that we're, we've just completed now. Um, and, and within this, we really identified a few instances where researchers are struggling. So we have the kind of classical issue which a researcher has when trying to find data, which is basically trying to identify uh, what data, data carries a particular concept or particular concepts, um, a, a pretty standard uh, kind of query across a, a data catalog. But then um, there were also instances that were kind of generating more complex questions. So for example, uh, Odyssey provides grants for researchers to use its laboratory and field questions in the, the list panel. But obviously if you're fielding questions in a panel, you wanna know if that question has been asked before. So you wanna search in the data archive of, of the list panel. But you also want to know if that data is in the linkable data at CBS. So you need uh, a data catalog that can not only say, is this data in list, but also in amongst the CBS data, is it, uh, are there concepts there that I could use uh, within the data sets that can actually be linked, be, uh, linked into this? Uh, and then finally, we also found that with the CBS data that is available um, uh, to researchers, it's exceptionally complex and very diverse. And a lot of the HPC facilities in particular we have in Odyssey have been really changing the way people uh, uh, use the data and the complexity of the, the data queries that they're, they're, they're producing. And I just wanted to, to give you a snapshot of what I mean by this. So for example, in the, in the, using the Dutch population registries, a project within Odyssey was able to construct um, whole population networks. So basically linking everyone in the Netherlands together based on family relationships, work relationships, education relationships, and neighborhood relationships. So identifying all the people you live near, but also people you go to school with, people you work with, and uh, people in your family. So not just parents, but also uncles, cousins, all these different kinds of things. So really developing very complex networks. And this has really indicated the, the, the potential value and interlinked and complex nature of the, the data that CBS hold which is very different from the kind of queries we you normally have within a data catalog, just trying to simply identify um, uh, which silo that you, where you're, the, the data you're interested in might lie. Because if you can uh, imagine the, the complex interlinked data within CDS uh, spinning out from this, we also have data that's also linkable in to this from the surveys. Um, and so it's really been a task of trying to understand how we can provide researchers with um, a, a port or a way to navigate uh, this complex interlinked data. Um, and so what we've come up with is the Odyssey portal in design. Um, we have, we're in the very early stages of this design and it was very interesting the previous presentation to hear about the development of uh, DDI CDI because I think there's uh, quite some uh, potential tie in here to, to some of our design elements. Um, in terms of uh, the existing meta metadata standards used across this Odyssey um, collection of data uh, that exists, within Dunzizi, or the data is annotated using uh, Dublin Core, um, which is a fairly kind of uh, limited uh, data standard, as we know. Uh, and then in CBS, they have their own internal metadata standard. I'm really interested to see the, the following presentation as well from uh, INSEE. Uh, about uh, the work they've been doing, because that sounds exceptionally interesting and relevant to some of the work we're doing. But uh, there are interoperability issues between that internal metadata standard and uh, the, the other data sources that we, we have. Um, but then we also have the kind of usual suspects, as it were, in terms of survey data and list panel data, which are using DDI Lifecycle and, and, and Cobook and, and others that are relatively well documented. And so we have this issue of trying to, I think very much as the previous presentation was alluding to, trying to aggregate up and make this more interoperable, especially with surveys such as the National Twin Registry, which is much more focused on uh, psychological data, or we have uh, a social media um, uh, data collection as well, that we'd be looking to integrate into the Odyssey data collection in the near future. So we really need to think about standards that have that um, brought into the disciplinary field. 
Um, so in terms of the actual design of the Odyssey portal itself, it's based on Dataverse, uh, developed by the Harvard Institute for Quantitative Social Science. Uh, and Dance is very active uh, in this community and has been hosting the, the Dataverse Puntanel um, setup in, in the Netherlands. Um, and it's going to be in a Dataverse based on the SESTA metadata model, which will then be used to map in these various existing standards. Um, and obviously the, the integration of the, the DDI collections within the Odyssey data collections uh, should therefore be relatively uh, straightforward uh, as they ever can be. Uh, and then the idea is then that they, this would all then be interoperable with the SESTA data catalog to, to allow for kind of a, a more international uh, view on the Odyssey data collections. So all the data coming out of uh, the metadata coming out of CBS would then be kind of uh, stored within the SESTA data catalog as well. Um, it, one additional element to the the Odyssey data portal that's actually uh, quite interesting and we, we, we're very excited about is we have a team at the Freie Universiteit in uh, Amsterdam, which will be enriching the metadata to enable uh, a greater degree of semantic search. And that semant uh, they'll be creating semantic linkages between various concepts that are extracted from the metadata, particularly the variable text and the questions and the detailed data that exists within surveys, because um, uh, the, the top level kind of data set level um, descriptions of concepts in data tend to be fairly limited. So we, there is a, a kind of need to go deep into the, the variable level data, the question text, and extract out the, the concepts there and, and, and um, create those semantic linkages across uh, the Odyssey data collections. Because here it's not just necessarily about identifying which data carries which concepts, but also how concepts interrelate across the, the, uh, the knowledge graph of Odyssey, as it were, um, because these are interlinked data sets rather than just uh, data silos. Um, and so basically, yeah, the aim will be kind of taking the data for system metadata model, producing this enriched knowledge graph from across Odyssey, uh, and then incorporating in the existing kind of controlled vocabularies uh, and thesauruses like uh, else. But there are quite a few challenges that we face uh, in doing this, as I say, it's relatively early days. I think we're about three months into what is a four and a half year uh, project. So we've got some way way to go yet. And we'd be really interested to hear uh, comments, suggestions uh, and recommendations, uh, particularly how this maybe can align with things like um, DDI, CDI. Um, but uh, the challenges that we're very acutely aware of, uh, particularly is the cooperation of CBS, the management of metadata within statistical processes is exceptionally difficult. And then having that spin off and be ingested into a kind of a research data catalog is, uh, is quite a tricky task because yeah, statistical offices aren't necessarily, it's not their primary function to facilitate research. It's, uh, it's a secondary function for them as, uh, basically. And so there is quite a lot of work to, to do on that uh, alignment front. We are very much blessed though in Odyssey and that CBS is a very active partner and a huge supporter of, of, of the work we do in Odyssey. Um, and so hopefully that will be a good basis uh, to, to, to collaborate on. Um, then we also have just the issue of these, these diverse metadata standards not really fitting within the CMM uh, and the degree to which they can be uh, kind of adapted to, to, to actually uh, functionally work within that model. Um, and then subsequently the, the semantic search uh, approaches that we intend to apply are pretty much um, limited to the quality of the metadata that that is built on. And so if the SESTA metadata model is a problematic fit for some data, the, the semantic search functionality will obviously be limited. But uh, so that's basically the early stages of where we are with this uh, project. Um, as mentioned before, if you have particular technical questions, um, please feel free to put them forward, but they'll probably be answered in the chat by someone who really knows what they're talking about. But that's uh, my presentation. So thank you very much. I also have a link to a, a paper describing this in a little bit more detail, which I'll also post in the chat in a moment. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, uh, actually, uh, uh, please, to the other ones, uh, put your uh, questions into the chat window. And actually, I have, to, in the meantime, two questions for you. But the the, uh, and actually, one is um, because I did not have the time before to 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 have a DDI CDI question. It's actually a combined question. But question is if if um, that if you can answer them because they're somehow combined. The first question is just a challenge that 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 you just posed. 
Um, because I saw you have a lot of metadata standards in comparison, because I know some of the data and I know that they are, for example, also described in different versions of, of DDI. So we're not even, even talking about Dublin Core and, and uh, the uh, SESTA model, but also the DDI versions differ. So the one question would be, how do you want to tackle these um, technical this, this problems between the different metadata standards? So have you already an idea how to go on with that? And the other question is maybe also something that refers to the presentation before, and also people from the Arafin and Hilda, for example, are also invited. Could DDI, CDI help you in from what you have seen in, in some of this respect because it crosses domains and maybe it's also possible to cross some of these certain flavors of different standards for that? Yeah, so I think I'll take the, the, <laughs> the, the second question first, because it's way easier than the first one. <laughs> but the, the second, uh, in terms of the second question, no, absolutely, I think the, the whole aim of the, what we're very conscientious to do within developing the portal is to ensure that it's aligned with the, the international standards and the, the developing uh, standards. And I think in terms of the, the issues addressed by CDI, it's, that's exactly the issues that we're facing. We have links to the, the, the health sciences. We have quite extensive collaborations with uh, health researchers, particularly if you look at the, so within Odyssey, we have this uh, secure sec computing facility. Um, and uh, what it's done is actually generated a huge amount of interest from the health sciences. Um, so we now have a lot of health science researchers uh, very keen to use our uh, facilities but also to use some of the data and to link into to using the administrative data from CBS in particular. And so creating a standard that can align with a lot of the you know, genetic data sets even um, that they're providing, uh, that's a real kind of common concern that we have. And so that, that interdisciplinary interop interoperability uh, is, is, is a big challenge. So I think that hopefully DDI, CDI will be uh, a good framework for us to, uh, to go forward on. In terms of the, how, the technical steps of integrating all these various standards, I think in terms of strategy, what I have to defer to, to some of my co-authors in the, in the chat in terms of the actual strategy, but uh, the hope is that um, because the, the SESTA metadata model is somewhat uh, less uh, detailed than, than DDI itself, that this should uh, uh, help ease that, that kind of um, integration process. Uh, that CMM would be a, a kind of more reduced model and therefore uh, issues of comparability, uh, compatibility would be lessened. But I will let Ricardo probably correct me and say uh, no, Tom's talking nonsense in the chat. Ingo, can I, can I uh, respond to the first part of Tom's answer? Of course you can. Because we've, it's interesting. I, I noticed some names that are very familiar, Tom, from from work within within CoData, actually, in, like uh, University of Twenty. I don't know even how to say that name, but there are a lot of people in the GoFair space because they have an office in the Netherlands, and the president of CoData is actually based in the Netherlands, out of that office. Um, a lot of people looking at the interplay between semantic technology and the health sciences and the kind of data mostly uh, demographic and population data, but from a health perspective that we're looking at with DDI, CDI. I think there's that may be an area that we could really explore. And the other part of this that I think is very interesting is Dataverse, because um, Steve McEckern has made it pretty clear that Dataverse is, is becoming a player in, in the DDI space. And we're looking at how, what you would have to do with Dataverse to add functionality based on the capabilities of DDI CDI. And again, that's an early, early days, but I really like the idea of exploring some of this stuff on with the kind of project that you're talking about here. I do think that the health sciences is an area where there's a lot of money and a lot of interest right now. Um, we've been hearing an awful lot from people in the Netherlands, uh, again, about the semant semantic technologies, things like Vodan are very popular there. Um, and I think there might be some places where we could work together to to explore this a little bit further. But I think it's very, very interesting, I have to say. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe one last question. Uh, there's an answer to the metadata standards combination in, in the chat window. So just read the, read the answer there. Uh, but there's one more question. What is the coverage of ELSST in, re in relation to your concepts? Uh, again, I think I would, for, for a proficient answer, I would uh, defer, uh, defer to my co-authors. 
who will be able to provide a, a more extensive answer in the chat than me butchering an answer here because they'll just uh, okay. shout at me afterwards uh, for getting the details wrong. Um, okay, then we wait for the answer in, in the chat window or in the question and answer window. And this is a good thing because then I can again, because right. we started the session late today, so in case anybody who joined later is wondering. So we come now to the last presentation um, uh, done by Franck Coton. He is uh, the scientific advisor to the director of information systems at INSEE, and he is a, pro a proclaimed metadata and standards addict. So last but not least, Frank, uh, Frank you have the virtual floor. Thanks, Ingo. Um, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, yes. good, excellent. Um, so I'm going to yes, talk to you about uh, how we use linked metadata and quality standards for the documentation of INSEE's statistical operations. That's a long title. Um, basically, the, um, uh, the outline of the presentation, first of all, I will, uh, I will say a very short uh, word about our statistical um, metadata repository. Uh, uh, it's called Hermès from the French Référentiel de Métadonnées Statistiques. Uh, that's basically in order to give some general context. I won't be long on that. Uh, then I will describe what we call statistical operations and how we model them. Um, in the third part, I will present how we decided to structure the documentation of the statistical operation. Part four will be about practical implementation and I will mention future plans uh, in conclusion. So a few words about uh, Hermes. Well, I have to say first, maybe that uh, the main topic of the presentations are uh, uh, open data and uh, linked data, or more precisely, open and linked metadata. So DDI is, is in the landscape somewhere because it's within Hermes, but it's not central uh, thing in, a, in the presentation itself. So uh, Hermes, uh, first of all, the major underlying concepts uh, that we used in uh, uh, building the repository. So of course, uh, Hermes is a central reference uh, repository. So it follows the usual good principles for- Oh, uh, Frank, what, one, one, one thing. Uh, we cannot, you can see your slides, but they don't move. So you, we are just seeing the introductory slide. Oh, okay. They need to be in display mode, Frank. Um, I think I am. So what about here? Do you see now, the? Uh, now I see. Now I see slide number number four. Yeah. Now, okay. Now... I will stay. In, I will stay in that mode. It's okay if you see okay. the, the 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 list of slides on the left uh, because uh, I don't think I can master the, <laughs> anything better okay. than that. So, <laughs> so uh, principle for constructing Hermes. Uh, so basically, as I said, it's a reference repository. So it, it has good features and in master data management, it has global naming. It avoids duplication, saying no duplication is a bit out far fetch, but it avoids uh, duplication. Uh, but what I would say uh, is uh, the, the most, I think, uh, interesting uh, underlying principles for Hermes. It's first that uh, uh, it, is relying on standards. And uh, second, I would say active metadata. So relying on standards, what does it mean? It means that uh, well, there's a general move within INSEE as in every uh, statistical institutes now to uh, move to, towards the use of, uh, uh, or at least to refer to UNEC standard, standards and models. So for example, generic statistical business process model. Uh, the general statistical information model that you probably heard of, uh, Arafan has had a mention to it. Uh, but for INSEE, for Hermes, we, we chose, we specifically chose to represent metadata using either DDI, so that's mostly for our data collection parts, the variables, etc., or to use RDF vocabularies uh, and principles in principle for concepts, classification, and uh, as we will see, operations. 
Uh, the second principle, as I said, is uh, activating uh, metadata. So using metadata in, a, in an active way. Uh, that implies, of course, that we use a life cycle approach and we try to attach metadata to statistical processes starting from the beginning and uh, not waiting until uh, everything is published. And active meta metadata is also uh, trying to, to, um, to perform machine actionability from metadata. So th those of you who followed the presentation of POGS by uh, Fabian this morning know already that we have quite completely automated our uh, survey, uh, business survey data collection based on DDI lifecycle. Uh, we are currently uh, working on extending this mechanism for household surveys. And uh, we also are thinking of using that kind of also uh, automati uh, automatization uh, for administrative data. Yeah, it seems like that 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 we somehow lost Frank. I don't know. Yes. Are you still with us? I think he's not with us anymore. Hopefully, he'll come back. Yeah. Uh, yes, here he is back. Probably had a problem with this. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I think, I okay. <laughs> problem with my internet. Uh, can you see my screen back? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So maybe I have to share it again. Uh, is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, I uh, hope you didn't miss too much, but uh, here's the architecture overview so, of uh, OMS. So you, you, you can find the two core uh, databases. First of all, the collector, collector repository on the right for the DDI data. And on the left, we have the uh, an RDF data, uh, data store, so an RDF trip store for the, for the RDF data. Uh, we have uh, tools for managing the metadata. So POGS, you may have seen this morning for managing DDI uh, data collection uh, module. And then we have Collectica Designer for the rest for the variables in particular. And on the left for the RDF uh, base, we have a, a tool that we built in-house, which is called Bauhaus. All of this is uh, accessible uh, via APIs and regarding the RDF part, it's uh, accessible as a Spark of queries. So for rich queries, uh, um, because well, the, the RDF triple stores is, that it is actually open on the web because we want to, to publish our metadata as a five-star linked open metadata. So um, if we go to, uh, what we call statistical operations. Um, well, previously we called that source uh, of sources in, in, uh, in English. So we, we used to, well, we publish information uh, for, for on sources uh, forever, I think on our website. Uh, uh, but sources, uh, as you can guess, a bit dissemination oriented. Uh, so if we want to put our uh, life cycle glasses on, we will now call them statistical operation. And that's really the, the difference between, between them. That's a difference of view, actually. But also a difference of formalization, because source, were, that, there was no formal definition of that. Uh, there were documented on the website, as I said, but there was really no standards uh, used to document, to structure the documentation. There was no recommended length for describing sources. There were, well, they were updated whenever. So that, that when we uh, try to in, 
integrate the, the, the information on statistical operation into uh, Hermes. We try to, to do a little better than that. Um, that's, uh, of course, uh, what, we, what we tried to do was to rely on the principle that I, I, I exposed uh, at the beginning. So try to rely on, uh, on standards. Uh, so we, 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 we conceived, let's say, a, a formal model for what was a statistical operation. And we also conceived a, a, a model for, for the structure of uh, the documentation of a statistical operation. So the model overview, I would say, uh, of, the, of the operations themselves, well, for those who know GCM, it's, uh, it's uh, really a, a no-brainer because basically we have this notion of statistical operation, which can be um, uh, surveys, of course, uh, but also different kind of things. Uh, uh, for example, it can be uh, the exploitation of statistical sources, it can be, uh, I don't know, fusions from uh, heterogeneous, heterogeneous sources and things like that. Um, and this operation, this, this uh, basic operation are uh, linked to GSIM statistical programs. Actually, they are uh, <laughs> GSIM uh, statistical programs. And uh, if we consider surveys, for example, so you have the notion of a survey, let's say the, the survey on, uh, I don't know, uh, time use, for example. And each year you have a repetition of this survey or each year or regularly you have a repetition of the survey. So that's the basic statistical operation. And uh, that corresponds to the statistical program cycle in GC. And we all so have so this notion of statistical operation series, which is the statistical program in GSIM. And we have this small loose uh, grouping of statistical operations, which is called the statistical family. Uh, for example, uh, all the surveys that are linked to a given domain, like uh, information and communication technologies or things like that. So you may note, you may observe that uh, there are also uh, links between statistical operation, uh, links, for example, for represent replacement when a new survey replaces another. Uh, and there are also links to external models. Uh, so provenance we mentioned already, SCOS uh, for labels, for nodes, and uh, basic doping core properties. That's an example, I already mentioned it. Uh, so we have a family of operation for uh, the surveys on the information and communication technologies. It contains five series of operations. Two are old ones. Uh, so the, the organizational changes uh, and ICTU surveys, and they've been replaced by a new survey on ICT enterprises. And this survey on ICT enterprises has been completely completed completed, sorry, uh, by two other surveys on ICT, one on very small enterprises, one on households. And so the whole thing is uh, the five series of operation grouped into a family. And if we go to the more detailed level of operations themselves, we have, for example, uh, the survey on very small enterprises has two operations, one uh, for the 2012 survey, one for the 2016 survey. And the ICT on enterprises, survey on enterprises, group 13 operations because it's annual and we have the operations from 2006 to 2020. Okay. Um, so now we have this model uh, on the statistical operations themselves. Uh, what we have still to do is modeling the documentation on statistical operation. As I mentioned, previously we have unstructured text basically, and we want to have something more activable than that. Uh, so more structured than that, of course. So what are the different options? I will probably not go into very detail uh, there because I'm already taking too much time. Uh, so we consider different options. And in particular, uh, the possibility to define specialized coast notes uh, which is the approach we used for classifications, for example. Uh, but the problem there is that the documentation of operation covers really a, a very large number of subjects. So uh, we'll see later in the, in, the, in the presentation how much, but it's very large. So uh, it's, it's, 
it seems like the approach of specializing scotch notes was not the most easy. Um, so what we observed actually was that the documentation on, on the statistical operation was largely uh, uh, overlapping with uh, what we call quality reports that we used in the statistical in the European statistical system. And so that's basically Eurostat defines a number of things of information uh, that we have to send to Eurostat uh, about statistical operation. And these cover quite a large spectrum also of information. So the idea that we uh, came up with was to use this uh, uh, statistical um, quality reporting to structure the uh, documentation of on statistical operation, and more specifically to use a, a, a standard that were just emerging at the time, which is called SIMS. So SIMS uh, is for single integrated metadata structure. Uh, it's been adopted by uh, the statistical uh, European, St uh, European statistical system in 2015. Uh, it's a convergence model between two things that existed previously. So, uh, so uh, a model which more, was more for user and uh, another one which was more for uh, producers uh, for quality reporting. Uh, it includes quality uh, indicators. So that's an interesting feature. The problem with the only problem we have with uh, with seems it's that it's formalized that as a SDMX metadata structure definition uh, uh, and we want RDF so we'll have to take care of that but other than that we say okay well that seems uh, seems to be <laughs> what we need for uh, documenting our operations so if you want a, a very high level overview of what's in SIMS, there you have it. That's 19 sections, uh, 19 topics, main topics, and inside those sections, that's 80 items, around 80 items. So you have there the, 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 the variety of, uh, of topics that are, that are covered by, uh, by SIMS. I'll let you read it, of course, I won't, I won't read it. But of course, uh, even if it was very, very encompassing, <laughs> we still had a few problems with it. Um, and in particular, uh, we wanted uh, information for uh, documenting our operations that were not in SIEMS, uh, uh, in particular, details about data collection. Uh, so what's the unit that we sample, what's the sample method, et cetera, et cetera. And a bunch of uh, really French uh, specific uh, uh, information, like for example, the, the visa number of the surveys, the legal status of the survey, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing also that we, we, we did on SIMS uh, to tweak it a bit was to use more specific types because basically SIMS is very, very poorly typed. It's basically all text. Even dates, for example, are represented as text. So that's not what we want if we want to, to use the metadata in, a, in an automated, uh, automated way. And we also define richer text types uh, because in our documentation for operation, we have a lot of references to external uh, documents, web pages, et cetera, et cetera. And we wanted to specifically model those, uh, those uh, references. Sorry. Uh, okay, so that's it. We have the model. We have the model for our operations. We have the model for our documentation. Uh, and now, what about the implementation? Well, the implementation, uh, we've been on it for a few years now. <laughs> uh, first of all, we worked on the content, of course, because uh, as I said, the text we were uh, we had uh, available for existing sources was completely unstructured. We have to work a lot with the subject matter experts in order to organize the text to put in into the new structure, et cetera, et cetera. We also had to agree on the list of operations with the external stakeholders, which is not as easy as it seems. So for example, we, we worked a lot with the, uh, the, the secure access uh, center, uh, the CASD in France, uh, in order that uh, what they called an operation, we also called an operation and vice versa. Uh, we had to update the uh, unstructured documentation, I said it already. We had to attach the documentation at the right level because sometimes there was information related to the series which was attached to the operation and vice versa. 
So that was really an important uh, effort. Sorry, uh, Tomate. Okay. Uh, so we all also had to, as I said, convert the SIMS to RDF. So I won't go into this because it's a bit technical and I think uh, only a handful of, uh, of, of uh, perverts <laughs> like Arafan or Akim would be interested in that. And so they can get back to me to know how we did that. But basically the idea was that we did what uh, Datacube uh, uh, was uh, in regard to the DSD, the information model regarding data structure. We did the same thing uh, uh, on the metadata structure definition in uh, SDMX. So we created a, a, an old version of the metadata structure definition model of SDMX. And when you have that, actually it's pretty easy to represent uh, uh, the seams or at, in fact any, any MSD uh, in, in, uh, in RDF or in O. So that's what we did. Uh, um, and also we developed a, a tool for metadata management. It's called Bauhaus. Well, it's integrated in what's called Bauhaus, which is more than just managing operation and, uh, uh, and their documentation, because it, it, we use it also for managing concepts, classification, structures, etc. And as I said, it can adapt to it, any metadata structure. Uh, it's open source, so you want to, if you want to check it, go on go on GitHub, and uh, you 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 can see there that uh, it's we are nearly at two thousand commits, so we are pretty serious about that. It's it's bilingual, but if you can if you want to contribute to any new language, German would be nice because it's called Bauhaus, of course, uh, and also it can be used for browsing. It's it's not only managing information; it's a, a nice way of browsing information about concepts or classifications or operations. So I conclude now with a short uh, evocation of next steps. Uh, so all this work now is coming to an end. Uh, uh, we are ready to go live. Uh, the publication of the information of uh, on our statistical operation will be uh, uh, is scheduled for April, next April. So I guess we will be able to present it in the next conference. Um, uh, it will be published, as I said, RDF for uh, rich queries, and also it will be published, the information will be published on INSEE's API portal. We have uh, API access for, for those who don't like Sparkle. Uh, we are currently working and we will uh, working, be working in the next few months about uh, better exports for the documentation, and in particular the fact that we can produce automatically the SIMS SDMX for Eurostat. Um, we will extend also uh, the, the system to more data producers. We were talking until now about, about INSEE operations, but uh, there are op other operations that are conducted by French Ministerial Statistical Services, for example. So we would like to include the information on those operations in the system also. We want to engage with uh, more users, and in particular, we want to engage with researchers and data archives, and that's why I'm making this presentation right now. Uh, and we want uh, also to use the system as a backbone, actually, because producing information about the, 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 inform the operation is nice. But of course, what we want really, what you want probably, is information about the data and the, the micro data. So that's what we are going to work in the next few. Uh, years, I guess, that's a long-term plan. So conclusion, we have remade the documentation of uh, the statistical processes using quality standards. It was a lot of work by metadata and subject matter experts, and also a lot of work for IT people. The resulting information systems ready to go live, and uh, it represents, I think, we think, a huge improvement in quality of the documentation. Uh, and there is a continuous quality improvement process in place. And we will, it's just the beginning, we will produce more metadata uh, in the future. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Frank. Um, I already have the first question from Arif, and strangely enough, uh, it does seems the, the question and answer thing does not, does not seem to work for some. So uh, what about publishing the old version of MSDs as a standard? 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I have published somewhere. I will send you the link, Arafan. You um, I would be. It would be nice to have your comments on that. Uh, the 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 mechanism to transform uh, the the SDMX uh, metadata structure definitions into R. So that's published as a pre 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 specification somewhere on the internet, and I will send you the link. But uh, yes, the idea is. Uh, I would like to have the time to to progress this this work as a. A kind of standard uh, way to do it because as i said it's really uh, inspired by what's been done on data cube it's really the same idea I, I i have an agenda when i ask that question frank even though you called me a pervert a metadata pervert um which is um there's a lot of interesting work around data cube at at the U, the un statistical department um around the sdgs and there's some pretty good um semantic people there and they might be interested but yes send me email and we should we should talk a little bit about that that'd be cool yeah okay Very good. actually maybe i have a historical question for both of you because uh um uh, is the sdmx guy that guy as well because there used to be the, the working group on uh combining the features of ddi lifecycle with sdmx something like four or five uh, years now it's even more than that and what do you think? Does it make sense or, uh, to, to go back into the direction of, of, of combining DDI and, and SIMS and ideally also with DDI CDI? Because I did projects about administrative and statistical data and uh, the representation in DDI was always a problem and we did not move that far to, to like you did now that to, to have an own implementation. But, but the problem certainly exists and I don't, I don't know if it has been uh, yeah. 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 Actually, the the what we call the statistical operations are, 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 are in terms of DDI, they are study study units. Uh, that's the so we can uh, consider that we made a, uh, that we attached the 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 SIMS metadata to study units in DDI. So it can be formalized a bit, a bit better, of course, but the idea is there. It's the, it's, if you go at the conceptual level, it's really that we attach quality metadata in the SIMS format to DDI study units. That, it's, an interesting, units. it's an interesting question, um, Ingo, because I think one of the things we did with, with CDI was look very closely at SDMX multidimensional data descriptions and um, I could see getting from register data that was expressed in an SDMX format quite handily into DDI lifecycle through CDI, honestly. Um, when we get into the metadata piece of this, things get more interesting. And the kinds of stuff that, that Frank is talking about at statistical operations, there is some quality metadata support in lifecycle, but I don't think it's quite the same idea as what you have in the, in the MSDs in SDMX. That's an area, though, that I think does does bear revisiting, in in some ways, um, because I think the relationship between GSIM and all of these standards is also really really fundamental. So um, I think parts of the answer are probably already there, but parts are probably missing. Would be my guess. Um, you know, but that's an, it's an interesting question, though. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Because we are really really late. Okay, we started 10 minutes later, so, so we're not that late, but we still are late. So I think more questions. Otherwise, of course, you can send the questions to the presenter. presenters. I think they would be happy to, to also follow up the discussion. And I would like to thank the presenters again for the great presentations, clapping all, uh, very often via virtual means does not make that much sense. It looks always a little bit stupid, but Feel, feel, feel a, a, a virtual clapping of around 50 people. Um, so thanks again also to the audience for participating. Uh, hopefully next year we will have this again in, 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 a, in a physical way, I hope. 